uh, with uh, this fireside chat. And uh, I don't know if Nico is still here, uh, but he asked me earlier, so where's the uh, fireplace? I said, the fire's over here. Oh. Uh, <laughs> cheesy, so, cheesy. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I, I have the pleasure of introducing uh, Simon Rothman, who is uh, by any measure uh, one of the, if not the leading VC person in the platform marketplace uh, space. Um, I got to, uh, uh, I met Simon at a conference that Greylock had, I wanna say four years ago maybe, on platforms. Um, and a, a common acquaintance invited me, Andre Hagiu, who's at uh, Boston University. And it was fascinating kind of meeting all these startups uh, on marketplaces. And there was a room probably twice the size and it was three times as packed. And, um, and uh, in fact, out of that came a fun relationship. I, I uh, agreed to meet with some regularity um, with uh, this uh, startup uh, uh, that is uh, uh, now called Roofstock, uh, oh. Gary. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and just seeing the proliferation uh, was, was really fascinating. And I don't have to say this here because I know there are people here in the room involved in, in so many uh, platforms. So we agreed to do this uh, um, little fireside chat, uh, and I prepared. Oops, and I prepared a bunch of questions. Uh, so I'll just uh, uh, run through uh, what comes up, and please feel free to add questions uh, uh, from the audience. And uh, and let me just start with uh, uh, something very basic and definitional, since we're academics and, and we love definitions. Uh, so you know, I, I, I often wonder about what defines a platform for an investor. Like when you're looking at these ideas and you have to put them, oh yeah, I'm putting this in the platform bucket. How do you think about that? Um, so I'll use platforms, networks, and marketplaces interchangeably. So um, it's interesting. I, when I invest in companies, for a moment there was a um, time where everyone wanted to invest in marketplaces. So everything you saw was kind of classified as a marketplace, even though they're not. And there's one right now that I think is largely viewed as a marketplace that I would not technically, so that might be a good study. But my um, definition of a marketplace is where the assets of production, right, um, is um, owned by the someone else, not by the platform itself, and the employees who provide that product service. So for example, if you look at, say, um, Uber or Airbnb, right, the individuals, the supply side owns the vehicle or owns the home, so there's no balance sheet for the company. And the people that provide it, the hosts and the drivers, are not employed directly, at least not yet. I know there's AB5 going on right now, but at the current moment, not employed. And so for me, the definition of a marketplace would be no balance sheet. You don't own assets, nor do you own kind of production employment. And the last piece is the function you have is to match supply and demand as your primary function and create the trust necessary to close that transaction. That's it. That's all you, you, you know, that, and it's a big thing, but it actually is a software thing. And so physical assets and people are not. The example I'd give you, so obviously Airbnb and Uber and Lyft fit, fit what my definition of a platform would be. The one right now that I think it's miscategorized routinely, um, and I'm an investor in it personally, um, an investor years ago is Lime, the scooters. And I hear it all the time, and especially since I'm a marketplace guy, like, oh, that's a great marketplace, it's growing really fast. And my answer is yes, it's growing really fast, but it's a service business. They own the scooters, they service, they maintain. There's some exceptions where they're trying to get the community birders, as they're calling from bird, where they would actually have a distributed labor force that actually maintains them. But that, let's be clear, if you own billions of dollars of scooters and scooters is the service that your business is in, you are a service company, not an actual marketplace. And I think the majority of investors, the majority of people in my, in my tech world would disagree with that. But that's, I think if I were going to find a marginal line, that's the marginal line. Okay, that's actually quite interesting because my next question, and this I think almost answers it, uh, was going to be, uh, when, when we think about platforms, uh, a lot of people don't think about supermarkets, right? But if you think of supermarkets, they have shelf spaces, and on the shelves are products of other retail, of basically wholesalers, right? Which is 
you know, a form of a platform. So, um, so I wonder, you know, is there this line where is this platformy enough or marketplace enough? And I think your answer by using the Lime example is a great one, uh, Bird or any one of these, because they basically, it's, it's the ownership of the assets. Um, but a, I would add one other thing, if I can. Mm -hmm. so, so yeah, unless if, if the grocery store were consigning the goods, I think you'd have a case of saying it, it's approaching a platform, mm -hmm. right? But here's the thing, when you look at investing for platforms, it's, the platform itself for me is very binary. I, there's no ambiguity to me if it's a platform or not platform. But where there is a continuum, and this is something I, I think is not really well understood, the continuum is of the strength of the network effects. Network effects are not binary. So if you take the components, the variables, um, there is um, how unique is a product or service, how fragmented is the supply base, how fragmented is the demand base, and how local, regional, national, or global is the distribution. The closer it is to a unique product with an extremely fragmented supply base, extremely fragmented um, demand base, and a global to um, national scope, the stronger the network effects, the opposite would be the weaker the network effects. And that, for me, I think is the most fascinating part of marketplaces as they look at them. Most people think, oh, it's a marketplace, high margins, high growth, low capital. It's not really the same. They're just not equal. And when I look at them, I will um, inherently kind of judge or score how strong the potential network dynamic is. OK. Um, I'm going to turn, and this is related to the network effects. Uh, uh, for those of you who haven't uh, checked out uh, Simon's webpage, uh, I urge you to because he wrote a lot and writes a lot and it's very eloquent and, and very thoughtful. Uh, and I spent some time reading some of the things that uh, Simon wrote. I knew the counter uh, went up by one more. So I really, really <laughs> okay. there. It went from three to four, my family and Steve. So I got it. So, <laughs> so in April 2016, uh, you wrote an interesting piece titled Why Uber Won? And, uh, and I'm wondering if you still believe Uber has. I mean, we all know that they're growing and growing and servicing uh, globally, but you look at the balance sheet and things are not that rosy. Uh, and, and in particular, you know, competition is not going away. We, you know, Lyft is still around. In uh, Asia, we have DD and Grab and, mm -hmm. you know, all these things. So I'm wondering now, three years later, what your thoughts are and how you might relate that to the network effects. So let me, let me break it up into two things. One, why I believe they won, um, and, and we can talk about what did they win, right? Is it a big prize, or is the size of the prize small? So, um, and I can even talk about the dynamics, how we got there, because it's a really, really interesting case study that hasn't been written that I think is pretty fascinating. But here's what I, I wrote. I wrote about Uber's strategy. Um, their strategy was not to view capital as financial, but to view capital strategic. They weaponized money. And no one had done this to this scale, and I'd argue anywhere near as effectively. They took what at the time was $9 billion in equity. I think it ended up being, I don't know, 12, 15 billion. They took capital, and what they did is they bought a network. So let me be clear. In the article, I lay it out where um, if CAC is less than LTV, CAC, uh, customer acquisition cost is less than uh, lifetime value, um, you're trying to buy. Um, you're trying to buy a, a sense of sc a scale and, and size that's artificial because it's, you know, you're spending more for users and their worth. If, you're, if your CAC is less than, not greater than LTV, you're buying speed, you're going fast, you're growing. But if your aggregate CAC acquisition cost is less than the aggregate network value, now you're buying a network. You no longer look at what one customer's worth. What is it worth? And they bought a $100 billion network and spent, at the time, $9 billion, which is a smart deal. Their competitors were looking at a user and saying, this user's worth $50. I'm going to spend $45. And they're saying, this network is worth $100 billion. I'm going to spend $19 billion buying it. And if I have to spend $5,000 for the user, I'll spend $5,000 for the user. And it was amazing to watch that happen. And everyone I was talking to was shocked, and they thought they were financially you know, um, just not smart, and they, were, they weren't very prudent. And I just thought everyone was missing the point, which is why I wrote the article. Um, if you fast forward now and you look at the market, you have Lyft has roughly a quarter to third market share, depending on what data you look at, in the US only. 
Lyft has not ever seen. Yeah. Uber has the remaining three, you know, two thirds, three quarters in the U.S., and it's a roughly similar split. And they're on one end or the other end of that split in every market. So there's a dominant player and a second player. And the real question that has not been asked is why is that true? If you look at all other platforms through history, before and after, Airbnb, who's the number two Airbnb player who has material share? The Airbnb, really? Not really. Who's the Airbnb of Europe? Who's the Airbnb of Middle East? Who's the Airbnb of Asia? Airbnb is the Airbnb of all those areas, right? You look at eBay in its prime. You look at Craigslist in its prime. You, you go through one after another of marketplaces, and you will, it, you will not find a duopoly in any of them. You won't. And the reason it evolved that way is Lyft and Uber figured out how to get liquidity at the same time. And it was a foot race for share. And they had weak network effects. They had local network effects for commodity service. And they had the playbook in hand. And then it was just an arms race. Who can raise more money? Who can move faster? Who is willing to break more glass in order to win market share? And then when it settled, all the dust settled, the shares were the shares. It doesn't shift much, and it's hardened. right? And so I think the formation period for ride sharing is unlike any other space I've seen. Interesting. And the outcome is mm -hmm. different because of that. If Uber had not copied Lyft, and I'm a personal, full disclosure, I'm a personal investor in Lyft 10 years ago or something like that, a long time ago. If they hadn't copied them, Lyft would actually be a monopoly here and maybe everywhere. They copied them, validated the model, commoditized the model by making it viable. It turned it into literally a commodity. You put money in, you buy the network, and that is what changed the dynamics of the industry. Hmm. You know, it, this brings me to a second question that's related. Um, if I get out of my uh, uh, list here, I, c I could show you the corner down here. Okay. Uber and Lyft. Right, and show everybody. Uber and Lyft are always right next to each other because, you know, especially for trips above the $10, $15 range, within 30 seconds, I'm going to check both of them. Now, maybe it's because I'm an economist, maybe because I'm Jewish. I don't know. The point is, I do price wow. comparison all the time, right? You went there. Yeah, surprised. I went there, of course. You know, I'm, I'm older than you. I'm, I'm from that generation. Um, and uh, um, so, so I'm, I'm kind of wondering, when we think of network effects, how much of it is at the platform versus the market level in, in your mind? Because in, in essence, if there is a certain service, let's say ride sharing, and, and I love the Airbnb example because you're right, it is very different, but let's say the um, you know, rent a sofa, rent a room, rent a home uh, arena, this market now people are more comfortable with it um, so that the network is people are looking for the stuff, people have the assets to put them on the sellers, uh, and then really it makes competition between platforms somewhat easier because the network effect might be at the market and not at the platform. And I'm wondering whether that is uh, the reality or no, the Uber Lyft uh, example really is an outlier because of some quirks. Listen, I, I don't know for sure. I can tell you my strong belief is that the Uber Lyft model is a complete outlier. You look at it, marketplaces um, structurally become dominant. That's part of their attractiveness, right? And the reason there is, I mean, you guys, everyone in the room, if you're in this room, you understand what network effects mean. Network effects get stronger as you get bigger. And what's interesting is that almost every other business model you can name gets weaker as it gets bigger. It slows, it's more expensive. Everything gets weaker except for network effects, which is part of the reason they're really hard to kill, right? I mean, look at Microsoft. I mean, it has, think about Microsoft. It created a network effect decades ago. It had missed multiple platform shifts. It missed mobile. It missed the internet. Like, holy crap, how many companies can miss multiple platform shifts? And not only survive, it's on pace to be a trillion dollar company. Its network dynamic is unfrickin' believable. Competitive products, the Google suite is as good as a Microsoft Office suite. It's fantastic. The network dynamic of it works. When I have it, I use it because I know the other person on the receiving end can open it and could edit it. It's, 
And it's a shitty product. It's not outstanding. Um, I think you'd be generous to call it mediocre. It's fine. Not collaborative in an era that it should be collaborative, which I still think they're missing also. I mean, it's, it's unbelievably powerful, and that's part of the beauty of it. But I think the anomaly is this multi-homing only exists if you believe that you can share that, that network dynamics don't work. And I, like I said, I think the legacy of how it got here, it's on the weekend of network effects. It figured it out at the same time. Those things are just really, really uncommon. And I, I will be you know, a little bit more direct. If one of the two companies had less than 12-month head start, if Uber had figured out, remember Uber was, was the bro business, the kind of the black car business, and it copied Lyft. If it were the other way around and they figured it out, and they had a year to go without being um, chased by Lyft, it would be a monopoly, an absolute monopoly. It would be, right? And so it's a really weird kind of twist of fate that you even have a multi-home, you, know, you even have a choice. I don't think that's common. Mm -hmm. Okay. Nor do I think it will be common in most, most marketplaces yeah. going forward. Yeah, no, that, that, that sounds quite uh, sensible. Um, so, you know, as, as I was reading through how Uber won, um, I'm going to quote something that you, you wrote in there that I, I thought was really interesting uh, because uh, it relates to something that as, uh, you know, as economists, uh, maybe this is less true for computer scientists because they're a little closer to the UX world uh, where economists, you know, we're in this world of rational optimizing agents, blah, blah, blah. You wrote, over the past few years, I have seen startups utilize cash to buy growth with the goal of optimizing the biggest top line possible while neglecting core elements of their business like user experience and customer retention. A founder's job isn't growth at all costs. Growth is the byproduct of an amazing user experience. And, and one of the things that always fascinates me is you know, the history and and, and progression of eBay, where you, you played a, a, an important role. You, you founded the eBay Motors site, right? Um, so do you think that this is how eBay really lost in a way, is that they were growing fast, but user experience was never uh, front and center? Okay, this is complicated. So you guys follow along, and if you want to slip, you know, slip. I actually think that an optimal user experience is not necessary for a marketplace. I know that's contrarian, and I, and I would say that's not true for every other business model I can think of. Liquidity matters most. You know, and if you really don't believe me, you know, I've got a little, you know, an eight-year-old son who's obsessed with cars and motorcycles, and we're actually literally today, I gotta get back in time, because we have a Craigslist seller showing up, and he's looking to buy a vintage little dirt bike. Um, but Craigslist, potentially the worst single um, popular website on the planet. No app, a team reportedly of 20 to 30 people mm -hmm. generating you know, 10 figures in income, only monetizing two categories, in every market you can name, in every city you can name, user experience is horrible. So I don't mean for marketplaces, user experience has to be ideal, it's liquidity. But here's what I will say for eBay, and this is what I believe generally, and it's been a long, it might seem obvious to you, this has not been obvious to me, is that I actually think the story of eBay is a story of a lot of companies that lose their way in that founder-centric businesses, Amazon with Bezos today, as opposed to Yahoo without Jerry and Dave, eBay without Pierre day to day. I think the founders, um, and it's not some romanticized version, like I'm a pretty objective guy, um, but I think the difference, if I'm going to rationalize it, is that when someone takes over a business that someone else built, they understand how it works. They don't understand why it works. And there's a big difference. So I'm a parent of two kids. My, you know, I look at them, and when they do something, I understand why, because some of it is me. Like, I look at them like, God damn it, that's, that's an issue I have, and I see it in them, and I, and I understand exactly where it comes from. I don't look at what they do and go, oh, they do these three things, therefore, them. like, I know. I know exactly what's going on. I know the why. And I think um, professional managers, as smart as they can be, anyone who adopts your kid, anyone who takes over a company, will never understand the why in a, in a way that's intuitive and innate, and also in a way that a founder cannot explain to someone else what it means. And I, I think that is the core issue. And I saw it happening. I was at eBay as the founder was there, then wasn't there. 
And as someone who really spends a lot of time trying to figure out why things work, I just, um, it's, it's been a fascination of mine, everything. I like physical things, I like software, like just, I really like not how it works, but why they work. People, like I'm really fascinated by this. I tried very hard to understand, and I think I understand it as well as anyone that didn't actually you know, start it. But most people didn't even understand that well, and I didn't understand it well enough. And I think that's the reason. And I think that's a common thread through a lot of these businesses. There is no sense of generational transition. If the business runs out of initial um, business model runway, there's a line of sight to how far your business can go with the initial product, with the initial um, business model. And when you run to the end of that, and I will argue Tim Cook is going to face this at Apple. He will. And, and uh, listen, I don't know Tim. That's not my space. But what I'll say is once the pipeline dries up, once the moonshot things that were started by Jobs, once all those things that the founder understands the market, the product, the business, like gets it deep in, in their bones, once that is played out, that next wave, that next generation will not do well. They will lean on their market, you know, their network effects, and they have network effects with iTunes. They're, they're doing a very smart job of trying to kind of control the money, own the experience. Like they do, but that all came from jobs. Let's be very, very clear. That's not you know, a brand new thing. That is a thing. But they, that will come to an end at some point. And when it does, that next generation after that will be pretty weak, in my opinion. Bezos, on the other hand, is just a beast. I mean, it is amazing what he's done with Amazon. Absolutely amazing. And it isn't that he's brilliant, which he probably is. It's he gets it. And I think he will, as long as he is there and fully engaged, that business will be really hard to compete against. It will be a generation-defining company. And as soon as he leaves, it will take a generation to unwind, but it will unwind. It's fascinating because you kind of answered my second question, which I'll still elaborate on, because um, you know, in economics, we think of firms as you know, some production function that fulfills a role, and you know, we have these caricatures of reality. And uh, from my own experience, uh, spending two years at eBay uh, in, in the research labs and technology unit and, and then spending a year as a VP at Amazon and seeing the differences in the way the companies run. And as an economist, I hate saying this, but it's so much about more of organizational behavior and culture than it is about you know, economics or technology. And, and the question I wanted to ask is, if I turn the clock back, I mean, we think of eBay's business model right? eBay is Airbnb, right? eBay is practically every other one, sort of similar to the way Craigslist is. Mm -hmm. And nothing came out of eBay, right? E even attempts that you would think where they bought GSI and they thought they'll do fulfillment and then they sold Follow GSI it. and, you know, which that is... That was goofy. That, right? Um, and if the answer really is, well, it's because they had the wrong people and they couldn't see it, it's something that for me as an economist is a very challenging thing to admit because you think, well, the business model works. You should understand there's a network explanation. You should understand it's about the two sides. Where else could we employ the two sides? Oh, we could do it for homes. Oh, we could do it for cars. And that didn't happen. And it's... Well, it didn't sound like I did it for cars. You which, did it for cars, right. Which went from nothing to $14 billion a year. So that was something. But the thing for Airbnb, I remember when I met Chesky for the first time and I saw the deck, and the cover of the, of the presentation said eBay for spaces. And then the company's name was Air Bed and Breakfast, or Ed, oh. Air, Air Bed and Breakfast, or something oh. like that. And okay, so it was, and then underneath, and here's the real trick you don't see Facebook for something, because Facebook is Facebook for something. eBay should have been eBay for everything. Right. right? For example, um, Facebook, when it sees a competitor, it first clones it, and then it actually tries to buy it, in that order. It did that to Instagram, eventually bought it. It did that to, um, for WhatsApp, and bought it. It tried to buy Snapchat and then just clone the crap out of it. And while it's not amazing, it was enough to destabilize Snapchat. There is no Facebook for ephemeral. There is no Facebook for, you know, to, like Facebook is Facebook for everything because Zuckerberg is there. Zuckerberg, and he has a lot of control. He bought Instagram, and when he bought it, it seemed silly. Yeah. We were actually <laughs> yeah. investors um, 
I mean, I guess a plug, in Facebook originally and in Instagram for three days. We're investing in, in Instagram. We invested, it closed on Thursday. Zuckerberg was like, holy crap, I can't let them get money into that. He then invited the founder to come into his house, and by Sunday, he bought the company for a billion dollars. I think they had, I don't know, a dozen people, 17 people, no revenue, numbers that weren't even a rounding error to a rounding error. For, but he looked at it and goes, Jesus, these guys get it? He didn't have to go to board. A board would never have approved that. That was the dumbest financial deal you can imagine, but the smartest strategic move he could make. And he did it. If you would have put a professional manager there, they would have rationalized why that was stupid, why that was small, and why they could do it themselves. He looked at it. The market cap they had was huge. He thought the risk was bigger than the you know, rounding error to the market cap. He looked at the guy and go, he's smart. I'm going to have him. I want him on my team, not on the other team. There's a old um, Lyndon Johnson quote, you know the political quote? I'd rather have them inside the tent pissing out than outside the tent yeah. pissing in. Mm -hmm. and, and that's a political context, but it also works for business. At some point, you'd much, much rather have someone really competitive and really talented on your team that you overpaid by two orders of magnitude than dealing with them for the next decade just chipping away at you, right? Brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Only Zuckerberg would have done that. Only a founder would have done that a founder with control, yeah, right? That's fascinating. It's, and by the way, he, he does it over and over again. He's gone from someone which I think there are questions, is he kind of at his age and kind of with his background um, able to run what will be one of the largest companies in history? And you see some moves like that, and the answer I would ask is differently is who else could do that? Right? It's mm -hmm. impressive to watch, mm -hmm. it really is. I, I, by the way, I just want to say, if. Things we're talking about, if there's like, oh, wow, I, I have a follow-up, please uh, feel free to uh, yeah, jump in. Okay, so I uh, just want to make that clear. Um, in, in, and some of these questions, by the way, are crowdsourced from friends and colleagues that uh, are, are in this broad space. Um, and so is the gilded age, the gilded era of new mega tech firms, you know, like FANG, yeah. GAFA, whatever we want to call them, um, you know, coming to an end, everyone has a supercomputer in their pocket, right? Um, or do we still have more of these companies, you think, coming down the horizon? I do. I think we have more, and, and fortunately or unfortunately, barring regulatory intervention, which looks possible, the FANG companies will all be trillion-plus dollar companies. They'll be multi-trillion dollar companies uh, before they lose their founder, before they lose, you know, their network dynamics weaken. And they all have network dynamics, which I find fascinating, For, with the exception of Amazon. They have purchasing power, but at an extreme, you know, level. Um, I think we're going to see some new FANGs. So I'm an investor in a space, autonomous vehicles. And a lot of people, I don't know, it's hard tech, and trust me, I've had a very hard time convincing people years ago when I made these investments. Today, it seems a little hypey. But the thing is, um, imagine instrumenting and networking all vehicles, and maybe even instrumenting the world we live in. Not just tech, you know, where you have LIDAR to, to interpret the world, but having the world send signals. I'm a stop sign, I'm a road. Like, instrumenting the world, you could eliminate 1.1 million deaths, but more importantly, you can take one of the largest industries on the planet, a trillion dollar plus industry, and actually network it. And I think they, those will create companies that will be worth hundreds of billions or trillions of dollars. And so I think we have a few of those really, really big ideas. But ultimately, what we really need to do is the, the computer in our pocket is about networking humanity, and I don't think we fully networked ourselves. I mean, if you really, really, really want to take this to its logical conclusion, we're not going to have an external device. It'll be implanted, embeddable. Eventually, it'll be ingrained more genetically, you know, in your hardwired into us. I know it seems all odd and science. I mean, it seems weird, but let's be clear. If I took this and I went back 100 years or 1,000 years and told people what it did, they would think there's something satanic about it. They would think there's some sort of weird, spiritual, religious. It would be terrifying, right? It would be absolutely terrifying. I think the same way we view biology and computer science merging um, is absolutely terrifying in many ways, I think, maybe an affront to you know, a lot of religious beliefs. But I think the ultimate networking is not this external device, but truly networking humanity. And think about the possibilities where instantaneously, real time, no language barrier, no latency for timing, and being like, it's 
and then making it so it's deeply embedded in how we think and how we, it's crazy. It's amazing and terrifying at the same time. And I think that's the ultimate, if you think of the penultimate or the, the defining network that can be built, it is networking all of humanity. And we're getting there. This is a very good stutter step to that. Yeah, okay. So you uh, mentioned uh, one word that a lot of people, uh, at least in my space, uh, uh, have very opposing views on, and that's the uh, R word, regulation. Um, and, and I'm wondering what you believe, I mean, the risk is clearly there because we see what's happening uh, globally uh, and, and populism doesn't help with that. What do you think the risks currently are for both the FANG, GAFA firms and others, uh, both in terms of regulation motivated by pseudo-economic uh, thinking like, oh, these are essential facilities, uh, and then, of course, the regulation that's more motivated by unfairness and... and yeah. Listen, I'm, I've always tried to define myself politically, and I, I think I would be a lowercase l libertarian, I think. Um, but my, my point is, I think this is not going to be an economic argument. It's going to be a political argument. And I think that's the wrong domain to have this argument. Um, and I'd much, much, much rather err on the side of being much more open and letting people you know, and companies do what they want to do, and then later kind of reactively kind of clean up some mess behind. And I'll give you an example. So I, I go through this thought exercise every time I do regulatory stuff, and I spend a lot of time thinking about this, because ultimately, um, in, in my world, and if everyone here is in platform world, it is in your world too, is that Everything that actually creates a innovative platform that connects supply and demand disintermediates everything in between, all the steps in between. And by definition, that revolutionizing the supply chain actually is, is, is in a head-on collision course with regulation. You cannot fundamentally change that and, and not disrupt incumbents um, in a very material way. So I think every marketplace of note, and I mean everyone, is going to face regulatory pressure by definition. They, the, the way I look at it, and I don't look at it as a bad thing, your idea is not that big if you don't face regulatory pressure. Mm -hmm. right? I don't even want to invest. A lot of in, um, companies, companies like, hey, here's the risk page. You know, and they put on the risk. on the, They say, we have regulatory pressure. And I'm like, great. And then they're, they're like, they usually get stuck on that page with investors. So what's going down? The AB5. And what do you think? And my thing is like, if you didn't have that, I actually would not be that interested. Your idea is pretty small. But because of that, you have to deal with this. And my worry is that the right thing to do is to allow this to happen. And the example I'd give is, um, the thought exercise is referencing is, I go back and I look at the dawn of the internet. So you go back, you can read about it. The very dawn, Bill Clinton was president. There was an enormous push to understand the internet and its impact and to tax it, right? which is not completely unfair. There's some questions about Nexus. So at eBay, we had this big question. If you have the companies headquartered in the Bay Area, you have a seller in rural New York and a buyer in Alabama, where's the Nexus in that transaction? Where is it? Who gets taxed? I don't know. No one knew, right? Um, but the issue was not unfair to think like, someone's got to be taxed, right? You can't buy and sell stuff and not be taxed. And what Bill Clinton did, which was, I think I look back and like, I think a little bit heroic at the time. Now it looks like it was an obvious decision. They said, we're just going to have a moratorium. We're just not going to think about it. Let it play out. It's in infancy. We don't even know what we don't know. It kind of is impressive it's working. America owns this. Let's just kind of get out of its way. And then eventually, we'll figure it out. I have no doubt the government will take a step in and we'll figure it out. Which, is ha which has happened right now, a lot longer than people expected. It right. took a generation. My thing is with autonomy, with commerce, with you know, now the labor force, right? And you're looking at W2 versus 1099. I don't understand why we lead with regulation instead of lag with regulation. If you lead with regulation, you will suffocate potentially an industry. And the world is very, very efficient. It'll just happen somewhere else. If, if anyone believes that by regulating these big companies, you end human interest for connection, or you somehow lessen net, the, you know, the kind of the, the laws of physics for network effects, or somehow you change anything, you're wrong. All you're going to change 
is the home where that actually is headquartered. That's it. That's all that's going to change. And so my worry is a political decision where you have very true, this income inequality, which is unsustainable long term, making a strategic or financial decision based on politics does not end well. And my real worry is that um, the US GDP will be impacted. And if you want to do another thought exercise, where would the American economy be today mm -hmm. if we lost, quote, lost the internet? What if Facebook was based in France and Amazon was based in Germany and Google were based in Italy? Go through the exercise and ask yourself, what, what, what would we be talking? Our income in, you know, inequality would be a small issue compared to the entire economy decelerating, where we're no longer, we're in this perpetual recession where we're having a very hard time, not like we're contracting, right? All the pains we feel would be magnified, right? And I think that's what we're talking about. I really do. I think this is um, of national security interest in many ways beyond economics. I think the politics will be terrifying one generation from now if we do this. I do. Yeah. I do. And I know it's alarmist and I'm a business guy. I get all that. But I'm actually legitimately scared. Well, I think the evidence that uh, works in favor of your conjecture is you know, look at where all these businesses are and look at Europe okay. that is much heavier regulated. Right, a lot more constraints, and businesses are just not popping up there. And that is not an accident. Of the course. idea, mm -hmm. this American exceptionalism, which I get it, and there's there's case for that, but the idea that we're so creative and we're so amazing misses the point that structurally, if you have the right structure and you have creativity and all that, then it will blossom. Right, it's like a plant. You need mm -hmm. sunlight and water and healthy soil. Right, you, it's not one element. And the structure here has been fantastic. The issue is that structure may not stay that way. Right. And I'm terrified when I read about the, quote, breakup. First of all, I don't even know what breaking up a yeah. big firm. <laughs> if you're talking about a platform, but think about this as well. You take a platform, which in many ways, these horizontal, rigid, singular, monolithic platforms, where do you break them? I don't even know where you break them. What you're essentially saying is destroy them, let them. There is no, there's no nice little piece. Like, sure, can you get rid of Instagram? That's fine. but Instagram isn't Facebook. What do you do to Facebook? Right. Are you do you break up? Like, what does breaking up Facebook mean? Right. It essentially means ending Facebook, mm -hmm. right? Or selling marginal pieces, which ultimately don't really matter. Like, you know, what you can split from Amazon AWS, great, you're going to split AWS. It doesn't make any difference. Amazon will still be a juggernaut rolling over every small independent business. It will, in closures of malls, that is now inevitable unless you end Amazon. But if you do, then it'll be someone else, and you'll still lose all those businesses, except all those jobs and economic you know, benefits will accrue to another country. It's, yeah. It feels crazy to me to watch it. I don't even know how this is an actual debate. No. Please. Do you see um, a role for regulation? Like, there's a healthy place, if, or just no regulation? No, 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 no. No, 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 no. Now, let me be clear. I think government and technology have to work as partners. And I'll, I'll, if you really want the the right questions, why isn't it happening? And, I, and I'll give you my theory. I, you know, I've you know, I've spent a lot of time in rooms with government folks, and I think I under well. I've rationalized my own mind why it's not working. Here's the thing is, I think you lag, not lead. So you need to understand what the issues are first. And second, you focus on safety in order to protect people, not in order to redistribute or somehow change the economics. Facebook is profitable, and it should stay pro. Like, there's nothing wrong with that. Facebook also has not protected the public. That, it, there is something wrong with that. But the idea that somehow Facebook is too big is, I think, the wrong framing. It is not its size and its profitability, which people resent, I think. It's the fact that it was indifferent to its impact on society on the way to making money. But the fact it makes money isn't the issue. The fact they, they need some sort of, and I think it's fine. They could have been imposed with this third party. They're doing this editorial body. I don't know if you saw where they're going to have this external body. They'll be able to make independent decisions outside of the company. And essentially, they're going to regulate themselves. And you can make a very fair case that Facebook shouldn't be creating that body, that that would not be fair, that the government, that's not unfair. 
right? That's not unfair. And what you should look at is how do you protect and, and say the government's job is to protect people. The government's job is not to take money, for, in my view, to take money from businesses that are working to destroy them in order to say either the money's going to go to someone else or there'll be no money to be made. That just feels like the wrong I don't, it just feels like the wrong line. But, but there is a place for safety, let's be very clear. And I do think if there are monopolistic or certain anti-competitive behaviors, there are, there are measures and there are things we should do. But this is not the debate we're having. The breaking up these big companies, essentially the way I understand it, and I've been listening carefully, is society is unequal and that is true and it is unfair and you can you can look at the numbers any way you want but you really have to distort them beyond belief to not see what's going on like it just you know it's just true right there's no the middle class is being hollowed out right you're becoming they're have and have nots and, and history has not been kind to that social structure at all that has led to every major war it's like it's bad so even if you don't even if you like it it's unsustainable but but the thing is when you when you when you look at that that the 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 role of government isn't to kind of rectify that that is a different thing it's to create a structure where people have ability and to protect people and make things safe so i i, I just think the line is is the wrong place i i find that small and probably irrelevant in the big picture of, I think tech is, is a more meaningful thing than a utility that was aggregating and was no longer pricing fairly. And don't get me wrong, it, in many ways it was unfair. I think it's immaterial. I'm, I look back now and you guys, maybe the impact is bigger than I, I fully appreciate, but when I read about that, it didn't sound like society was, started. it felt like people were gonna overpay and that's bad. But that's not horrible. What we're talking about now, I think, is significantly worse. I actually think we have our society so imbalanced, and the world is seeing this with populism and nationalism and, and holy crap, um, is that if we don't do something, and there's a political issue and there's some economic issues, there will be a price to be paid. And this looks a lot like what all major wars the period, the era that precedes them, we look exactly like that. And I know no one likes to say it. This looks a hell of a lot like pre-World War II. Like, it's terrifying, right? But the government forcing and taking control, I think, exact, I think makes it worse. And if you want to kind of think through it, imagine this administration having full, a lot more control over that. Is that good or bad? And the question would be, why would any future administration be better? I'm not sure the answer is more centralization. I'm really not. Mm -hmm. Taking maybe a different angle of this, what do you think about innovation in this age where Facebook can just like try to copy you and then buy you? Um, maybe as an investor, what do you think about investing somebody like Snapchat today? Well, to your point, most investors who focused on social as their thing, and I, I know some, are no longer investing or they switch their focus. Investing in social networks in the era of Facebook is a bad career decision. It is. Now, you could, your question, which I think is what it's leading to, is is that the right place to be in or not? It may not be ideal, but the question I think you have to ask yourself is is the right answer to break it up and hit the reset button and go, now I'll have at it? You're just going to get the next Facebook, right? And it's just going to happen all over again because now you've created the, the vacuum, right? Like someone's going to fill that. And these businesses that have network dynamics become dominant. And the question of society, we should say, should there be no dominant companies? If that's the case, we're going to have no platforms, none, right? And I'm not sure the platform is at fault. And, and let's be clear, platforms do topple eventually. They all weaken. And you could have made on the margins that Facebook cannot buy serious competitors. I think that's actually pretty fair. Instagram, I remember when Kevin came and he presented to you know, our partnership, and I didn't ask many questions. The numbers were impressive. He's super impressive, but I did ask one question. I raised my hand and I said, how can you survive in a world where your core business is sharing photos? And if I were being a very cynical guy, I'd say Facebook is a photo sharing app with a thin layer of communication. 
you are competing. Like, and how how do you compete with them? How do you, you know? And and I asked them, and I got the, the kind of answer smart people give you, which is you know it's different and whatever. But ultimately, he was going to be on a collision course. He was either going to have to be able to take on Facebook, or get bought by Facebook, or get crushed by Facebook. Um, and if they if Facebook weren't able to buy it. I think Instagram today would be a $50 to $100 billion company. Would it be a trillion dollar company? Probably not. Would it be real? It would be. Now, it wouldn't be as big as it is today. It's its size today because of Facebook, but it still would be material. And I think on the margins, you can do that. Maybe you have rules where you're not allowed to buy any adjacent business. If you're a network or maybe any company, I think that's fair. Maybe you're allowed to buy geographic competitors if you're weak. So you could buy the German Facebook if Germany had a Facebook, or like Uber can buy Didi, like, but you can't buy Lyft, or you can't buy um, Convoy, which is Uber for freight, which is one of my businesses, or you can't buy Uber Eats, which would be maybe um, DoorDash. So no adjacency in your dominant markets. You can buy geographic, no adjacency, but you can buy core geographic. That doesn't feel stupid, right? That's fair. But breaking up the company seems nutty, I think. Yes? Uh, you said social is not the place to be. So in terms of looking forward and what new things could come up, what do you think is the place to be? And is there any part of that that can actually help bridge that divide which is being created? Right? Well, if you guys know the next place, tell me. I'd love to know, and that'd be <laughs> awesome. I can tell you where I'm, I've invested recently. So like I said, I've done um, autonomy, and I think there'll be some great networks built around that. But it's hard tech and networks, and it's really complicated, and I've made a couple big bets. Um, okay, so, so I believe in that. I'm putting my money where my mouth is. I believe in B2B marketplaces. I did Convoy five years ago, almost five, and it's doing really, really, really well. It's great. It's, it's doing great. Um, I think it's going to be a meaningful company. And the, re the reason I'm looking at B2B, and I'd even put FinTech there, is that the obvious consumer-facing marketplaces that you can be your own consumer for, that are straightforward, I think they're, they're verticalizing. I know you, you and I kind of you know, went back and forth. Like, I think the horizontal plays are mostly played out for the tech stacks that we have and, the kind of, and what's happening is they're starting to get narrow and deep goats for shoes. I didn't buy these there, but I, bought, I buy a bunch of hard to get gym shoes on goat. It's great, but it's kind of a gym shoe marketplace, right? They're getting narrow. So if you want bigness right now without any um, new distribution platform, without any new technology stack, I think you have to look at B2B and I think FinTech, mostly because they're very sophisticated and they're not easy to do. Um, um, B2B in many cases are unsexy. I remember when I met the guys doing Convoy, I'd been looking for a trucking marketplace, and I talked to a few. Um, I like transportation. It's a space I like. And I like the fact they loved it. And we, we had that conversation. You know, it's The head of data science was here for the last three days, oh. but I had to go back today. He's great. So, yeah. Yeah, you know, and Dan and Grant are fantastic. Um, but it was an unsexy space that was not well understood. Trucking is not, you go through Stanford and Berkeley, you go through, trust me, you're gonna understand very little about trucking and you're gonna want to know it even less, right? <laughs> um, so I think finding blind spots that are complex as uh, financial services, as un, um, um, unaddressed and kind of overlooked as trucking, and I think you have to find those pockets to find these big horizontal plays. And that's, I look at them, but I only look at the ones I find personally interesting. I'm not going to spend the next 10 years of my life, you know, on some weird, you know, esoteric board. Like, that's just not what I want to do, you know, but those are where I would look for the next thing. When the distribution channels change, there's a next generation of distribution channel. There's a next generation of technology. And I think um, AV is next generation. Then I actually, all of a sudden, there's a whole bunch of new opportunities. I want to go back to the government uh, uh, and, and company interaction. Um, another article that you wrote that I enjoyed very much is the one where you, uh, uh, I don't know if you coined the term, but I thought it was pretty cool, uncollared workers. I tried. I tried to make it a thing. No one adopted it. <laughs> no one adopted it. it. I think it, right. you're maybe the only other person that's ever said it out loud. <laughs> right? I so tried coining that un years Uncollared ago. workers. They're blue collar, they're white collar, they're uncollared. Basically, the online. Uh, the the uh, gig workers, the, the gig which workers. I never, I didn't coin yeah. gig. I should have yeah, done yeah, that. Yeah, so. that's exactly. Uncollared. uncollared. So, so uh, you know, you wrote this in 2015, and, and now it's just becoming a real 
topic of conversation is the whole issue of, you know, health care and wages and everything that goes with it. And of course, in the United States, uh, we have a problem that by and large, private health care, because we don't have a one pay system, yeah. we could, that's a whole different argument. Don't want to go there. But it usually goes together with the workplace, right? So, you know, if it's double risk, I could lose my job and my health care. Yes. Right. So um, so there, there are two things I'm wondering about your thoughts about. Uh, one is, is there a path towards a healthier discussion uh, where government will provide the kind of regulation, infrastructures and other inputs into a world that will be more accommodating for this? Um, where in some countries like Canada, maybe or Scandinavia, it's much less of a problem because oh, yeah. of health care. And, and the second question is, should we be concerns, concerned about, at the end, platforms sucking up the surplus so that these uncolored workers are basically minimum paid uh, employees? Well, so two issues, let's separate mm -hmm. them. So yeah. the first issue is that um, you know, it's something I, I care about and I've thought about for years now, which is, what is how do the regulatory impacts affect people, right? Because ultimately, the regulatory stuff can be who makes money, who doesn't, you know. But you're talking about livelihoods for people. And so my view is that the gig workers, um, there is a generation, and now it seems obvious, although we'll see if, if it actually plays out, but that people will not be working for monolithic companies, that many people will be working for multi, multiple platforms, right? Um, and we can talk about why that's true, and, and I just think the era of these, these, singular, these singular corporations offering a singular service will give way to these distributed networks, um, millions of people offering a um, combined or collaborative service, right? And I think, I think we're gonna see this decentralization. It's more efficient, there's a whole host of reasons why that's gonna exist. But it does beg the question, what do you do with workers? And right now we have two classes of workers. You're W-2 or 1099, right? You're independent contractor, or you're actually a full-time employee. And with full-time employment comes benefits. Without, you know, for 1099, no benefits, um, no training. I mean, it's, it's terrible. Um, but you have control. So right now you have a world, I have control, but no security and stability. I have stability, but no control. I think the world needs a third class of workers, and, and what I've written about is a um, dependence um, contractor, where you would have the benefits of both. You determine, I want to work for Uber, I want to work for WAG this afternoon, or whatever. You decouple the benefits from your employment, and then whatever hours you work, maybe pro rata, they would pay for it if there isn't a single payer for the government, and that they would share the burden of that, and they can train you, all they want to train you. So you decide what you do, when you do it, you have stability of some prorated pro um, healthcare benefits, while if, if it is, you know, but it's decoupled from any one corporation, and you create that class. I thought it seemed reasonable. So I got, I, I've written a bit about the stuff. Um, the Obama administration reached out to me, I was, holy crap, and asked me to come in for this like conference thing. I'm like, yes, I'll go, sure. Went there, it was an interesting experience. Um, but when I was in there, and they had a lot of breakout sessions, and I was asked to speak at a couple of them, so I went to one of them. And it took me about 10 seconds to realize, um, you know, I was there as an invited guest to be the token um, capitalist or token venture guy. My first session I was in, holy crap, I sat there and I was yelled at, and I mean literally yelled at by a question. He wasn't even asking a question, he was ranting and screaming at me. And he was the head of some union thing. And all, like, there wasn't, you know, and so I try to answer and I say, listen, I think this is good for workers. Um, I think having control, I grew up lower middle class. And I think what is the only thing worse than not having money is not having control. And I think people who are wealthy actually um, assume your default state is control and that you're just um, trying to optimize for more capital, right? More cash. And that's really not the case. Usually you don't have cash or control if you're, if you're poor. Uh, and if you had to make a trade-off, many people would take control over cash, right? They, they've learned how to live without cash, but it's hard to learn. And so I'm trying to explain that. I'm trying very hard to explain that, and it's, it's horrible. Um, and so by the end of the experience, what I realized is the Democrats, and, and, and I, I identify as a Democrat, so you know, I'm, not, I'm not trying to bash it, but the Democrats were framing the issue 
as pro-worker, means you're pro-W2, anti-worker, you actually want these Ubers and Lyfts to be 1099. And that framing is politically expedient. It works. It freaking works. And I told my guys when I got back, I called up all my guys in marketplaces and said, you need to give me a plan before our next board meeting how you're going to turn every worker eventually to W-2. We go, we can't. This is going to I said, I'm not saying today. I said, I'm convinced there's 0% chance that this is not eventually going to happen. It could be years. It's going to happen, and you need a plan. And I did. I had every one of my companies. And it looks now like we're seeing it with AB5. It's going to happen. I think it's a mistake. I think the right answer is to recognize the workforce has shifted, create a class of workers that represents the current status of the workforce, and then, and again, not predicting who does healthcare. Who knows how that's all going to play out? But actually make it so that the, the classification of work is something that feels um, Progressive is a loaded word, but, but feels um, relevant to today's mm -hmm. workforce. But I do not believe that's going to happen at all. I, as a matter of fact, if I'm a betting guy, and I, I bet for a living, <laughs> uh, I bet that is not going to happen near to midterm. But if I also were going to bet long term, if someone gives me a generational bet over generation, I think it is inevitable that the worker classification will ev eventually resemble the workforce. Okay. Uh, but it will be a painful, there will be a 20 year period I think is going to be exceedingly painful. Mm. And what do you think about the concern that, you know, once we're living in that space sooner or later, uh, uh, that platforms will be able to extract a lot of the value generated and that, well, you know, it might even exacerbate that uh, I hear wealth you. distribution into so, distribution? I hear, I hear it. But I think possible problems do not equal definite problems. Mm -hmm. So here's what's happening. The, the platforms actually unlock a lot of rents. Distributed assets. Uber doesn't have to buy vehicles. You use your own vehicle. That's highly efficient. Capacity utilization, amortization. Holy shit, that's a lot more efficient than if Uber bought them and actually had limited utilization. You de decentralize workforce. So the workforce doesn't have to work full time. They can work um, and they can scale up or scale down. Like It's very dynamic and very decentralized. It's really efficient. Um, so and, and you don't have to house two million people, you don't have to have big buildings, you don't have to worry about laying people off, like, holy shit, like, it's amazing. So those rents get unlocked, and that's a good thing. The question is, there's three main constituents it goes to. Either the company, and the company can keep it in margin or pass it on in dividends or whatever, but the company gets it. It gives it to the customer in lower prices, right? It gives it to the service provider, in this case, the driver or the host, whatever and kind of higher, um, higher take. They give them a bigger piece of it. So the real question isn't, should we somehow reduce the ability for companies to unlock more rents? Efficiency and productivity is inevitable and desirable. The question is, how does it get split? And I have my own theory of how it ends up getting split, but I don't think it's as easy as saying, if the companies unlock it, the companies will keep it. So I'll give you an example. I think these, these platforms need to have a higher degree of transparency and to um, instrument and measure everything. For example, if you have a host that's unusually good, you as a platform at Airbnb should pay them more. Why isn't there a VIP level? Because the service is fantastic. Because if they left, that would hurt you, right? Or if you're a driver who is productive. Or had, my thing is, the, if you make it, or if you have some competition, you like you need to create the 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 um, environments where the the money, these extra rents, go where they belong. And I agree. Without any pull anywhere else, the companies will keep it all. I'm saying is you we should create some pull. We really should. And if you're looking with the the the. Um, Uber and Lyft has its own dynamic, which is actually beneficial to all the participants there. They would not be paying people as much as they're paying them. Um, they just wouldn't. And you can argue they're not being paid enough. Trust me, they'd be paid less if Uber was a, a monopoly. So I think the right thing is to try to find that um, tension. And with that tension, I think it will get kind of rationed. But without that tension, I think the companies will aggregate all of it. And, and by the way, Historically, that's what's happened always. So think about it. You do a price increase or you somehow have a productivity gain in a company. Where does that money go? Shareholders, the company mm -hmm. and the shareholders, right? Um, so I, but I do think there's some role for third parties to help create some tension there. Okay. 
I know we're out of time. I just want to see if there's maybe one or two more questions, please. Um, You'll be next. So I have a question about your definition of marketplaces, you know, as asset light things. Um, asset free, not even asset light. Let's be clear. Yeah. Look at lending marketplaces and look at like lending club and so on, right? And they're truly, I mean, they didn't take the loans on their balance sheet. And then, you know, SoFi, some of the other, the way that thing has evolved, they're taking it on their balance sheet. Yeah, well, no, no. But let's, there's three distinct. One is you take it in your own balance sheet, you're a bank. You can call it, you're a financial institution. You are, right? Pretty quickly, sure, so. but financial institutions do that. And by the way, let's be clear, you don't produce the money, you're buying the money from, the, so at the end of the day, you're still a bank, you're, or a financial institution, in my, and I think technically you would be one too, but, but practically you are, even if technically you're not. The second one is you borrow money, it'd be like um, WeWork or We Company or whatever. They don't own the buildings, they lease them. They're not a frickin' marketplace. I, I'm shocked, like, why are people calling them a tech company, right? That's how the lending thing is. But if you go the third step, which is where it is a marketplace, imagine people, real people, lending their money to other real people. Which is how it started, right? Lending love and so Right, and they stopped doing because the leverage wasn't great. That's a marketplace, in my opinion. The second one where you borrow money and then you just sell the money, you know, resell the money with a markup, makes you some sort of quasi-financial thing. And then if you actually have it on balance sheet, I think you are clearly a financial institution. Short time, you know. Doesn't matter. Yeah. Does not matter. And my view is it isn't um, the length of time, and I'd even argue it isn't the size, it's the fact that you are a principal. A marketplace or a platform is not a principal. There is no financial risk. None. None. And all this stuff, WeWork has enormous financial risk. If you look at WeWork, WeWork is essentially, if you think, they're buying 30-year 30 30 commitments and they're selling it in 30-day increments. It's buying a newspaper and selling you the sports section, right? Like, it's, it's not a, tr like, I don't get it. WeWork feels more like a financial company than it feels a tech company. It's crazy. Yeah. I don't even, like. Real estate finance. It's real estate, fine. It, it's not even a close call. Mm -hmm. It's weird how people are like, it's a tech company, it's nutty. But what you're talking about, those, there's three buckets, and I think people, it's, it seems confusing, but it is, you're not a principal. Here's another way to think about it. I think about, imagine this physical room, a school, right, or whatever, uh, or physical room. If you own the room, and you set the rules, who's allowed to come in, who's allowed to go out, based on some very fair, open rules. You're the venue, you're the location. I'm not a principal. Whatever's going on in here, you could hold an auction here, buying and selling stuff, I'm indifferent. I just get a piece of what happens, and I make sure the room is safe, people are vetted, the lights are on. The, the actual place is not a principal in the transaction. The only way you're a principal in this transaction, you get a take, and you bring a take because you, ma you match supply and demand and you're in a trusted environment. But your take is not a, it's not even being a proxy for a principal. It happens to be a byproduct because it's the easiest way to charge. You could charge just for room rent. You could just say, if you're on my platform, I'm gonna charge you per month. Turns out that's not, um, it doesn't align incentives, but it, it's, it's a head fake. It, there is no principal interaction. It is, you're not, if that makes sense. Gotta get completely out, and that—that's. And let, let's be clear. I, I don't define. I've written the book on it. It's not my. It is my definition of what a platform is, right? Right. So I want to go back to slightly more <coughs> technical point, uh, issues, but it's still still related to the division of, sort of surplus. Um, so there are claims here in you know, statements that you know platforms will take all the surplus, and then the other two sides will will be left with little. But if the <coughs> setting is even somewhat competitive. Then that's highly questionable, and you know, as right. we saw in like you know, Uber and Lyft, you know, they're losing billions of dollars a year. So, in fact, my question is the opposite. In a setting where markets are fairly competitive, or another example would be something like Upwork, where you know, there's test crap, but there's other other things where you really can't take much of a cut as a platform. You you generate a lot of value, but what other than just straight up commission, which may work in some cases, but in many others may not because of competition, what are the other good ways of monetizing well-functioning platforms that you've seen? Oh, you, know, you set up a platform, but yeah, the platform itself does not gener generate value, but not... Yeah, with you. How, how would you monetize 
monetize platforms like that other creative ways? So two things. Let's do the first. The first is I agree with you with the rents. I do not fundamentally believe that the platforms will absorb all the rents. Uh, let's play this out. Let's assume one assumption that there is a gig economy. There's a lot of workers. They're semi-skilled to unskilled. Certain platforms are going to want the most skilled of them, and they're the ones that create the most value, and there's most economic, right? They've unlocked the rents the most. They're now fighting for growth with one, a dog walker versus a host versus a driver versus whatever, right? They're going to go, we unlock X dollars of value per hour. We want your hour, and you're going to segregate and go, but we want the best, the service-oriented, the most reliable, who can live up to an SLA, whatever it is. And they go, we don't want you to spend an incremental hour dog walking. We're going to pay you more. You're going to find, and they're going to take part of the unlocked rents. They're going to, like, there will be an equilibrium. Because remember, it's not just um, being a dominant player in one space. You're not competing with every other incremental gig hour and who has the highest marginal value per hour. That's what you're really doing. And the people who have unlocked the most are going to pay the most to get the best. And then the dog walker is going to be the least reliable and the least skilled. It will be the most unskilled. And that will be 15 bucks an hour. And this will be 30 an hour. And the 30 an hour is high relative. And eventually, they might have to pay and subsidize your insurance because I can't only get people with good. Like, it will, as long as you believe there is um, a stratum of this type of work and it is big, there will be some competitive balance. And maybe not enough to make it fair. And that's, that's, but the idea that it's all going to go only works, in my view, is if the platform has all the control, meaning it's a monopoly, and there's only one industry that has gig workers, and the unemployment rate in the nation is high. Well, that's possible, but how likely is that? We live in the exact opposite world right now. Gig economy is exploding. The unemployment rate is low. They're all fighting. They're, as a matter of fact, Uber and Lyft spend five, ten thousand dollars getting one driver. It's unprecedented, right? So, so that's it. the second is how do you align that? I do think that the the hourly rate will give way. I think if there's enough competitive pressure and enough economics that are unlocked, we're going to see what happened. If you look at labor over generations. Um, and I, I've started reading some of this stuff, and I need to read more. You may under, but if you look at like how benefits, you know, pension benefits, defined benefits, not defined contribution, defined benefits, they came as a concession post World War, mm -hmm. and the idea was they didn't want to give more wages. They thought it'd be cheaper because people worked and then they died, right? They're like, oh, I'm going to give you. Well, it turned out that wasn't such a small concession. The, the demographic joke is on the companies. Like right. they now are, are drowning in this you know, just enormous burden. But the thing is, companies will be creative and give you things. The ARB is you may not take the shape. I think ultimately what's going to happen if I'm a betting guy, in a world where this is moderately to heavily competitive, so not modestly to lightly competitive, what's going to happen is, one, they're going to get equity. Because it's free to give. And for some of these companies like Uber, it's going to be life-changing. Life two, I think ultimately training benefits ancillary stuff where there's um, scale benefits for the business because they can, they can create their own insurance pool. They can actually insure your vehicles. They could purchase the vehicles and sell them to you at cost. If there's a way that the company can actually get an ARB where it's something's worth more to you than it costs them, I think you're going to start seeing some of that. And those will be meaningful. I think, by the way, I think housing will end up happening here for workers. You know, like you look back, everything you know goes full circle. They're going to have company town nonsense. Like, I think you're going to see benefits that come to workers to distinguish companies in ways that are not just in an hourly salary. And I think that's inevitable. But what I'd love to see, the right right answer, if it's super competitive, is equity and a piece of the principle, meaning a piece of the actual pie. I don't think that will happen unless it's really competitive. But I'm not convinced that's not going to be the case. I, I think a lot of people are convinced somehow. I'm not convinced that we're not going to be pricing the gig workers at the high end at 30 to 50 bucks per hour. I think that's very all in. I think that's fully possible. OK, well, let's all thank Simon for his time. Yeah. Thanks, guys. And I want to thank everyone who came and participated in the conference. And uh, hopefully we'll do something similar in five years. I don't know. <laughs> five years, ten years. Yeah.